Please join me in welcoming Dean Phoebe Haddon. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to have so many of you here with us for this event. Uh, and it's just the kind of event that we like to have here at Maryland. You're an ecumenical group. You include both lawyers and law professors, but you also include a photographer, an authority on documentary films, uh, a public relations professional, as well as lots of students and uh, advocates of students and consumer privacy interests. Uh, professional diversity is very important to us. Uh, it's uh, really a hallmark of this campus that we think about interdisciplinary and interprofessional thinking about problems and social problems like this. Uh, and we believe it's critically important for lawyers and law students to have these kinds of discussions. So I was delighted when I heard that Claire and other student editors had decided on this topic. You know that Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and other social media centers have become social institutions when th uh, agencies like the NYPD issues three pages of policy guidelines instructing every member of its force to, as to how they are to use these media. Uh, and they did that just last week. Although social media is ubiquitous and permanent, we all know that the technology that propels it is highly dynamic. And we also appreciate that the laws that are shaping how we use it and how it grows is, is still emerging and undefined. Social media policies can range from the best practices adopted informally by an organization or industry to full-fledged laws enacted at the federal or state level at this point. The Maryland legislature, for instance, has been in the forefront in responding to some of the legal concerns about social media, particularly with respect to employment law. The bottom line is that we've got a lot to learn from each other, and we've got a lot to tell uh, legislators and other policymakers as they move forward in the future. So our panels today are going to do just that, examine the issues. And I look forward to sitting in on at least some part of this uh, discussion. And I want to hear a full report later uh, about what I missed. Before leaving you to your work, I want to uh, once again thank the people who have supported uh, this effort to bring together so many interesting people. Of course, at the top of the list is Claire Roller, who you've just met the executive symposium editor, and she mentioned uh, Josh Chasen, Chasen, who is her successor. So thank you very much uh, for the work that you've done. I also want to acknowledge Patricia Campbell, uh, one of the members of our faculty, but also who heads the Maryland Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center. And I'd like to thank Jennifer Ivy Crickenberger, a business law program fellow, Hillary Hansen, who is also acknowledged uh, uh, and who is the Associate Director of the Business Law Program, Julie Hopkins, who is Manager of the Intellectual Property Program, and many others who have contributed for, uh, to this uh, effort. It's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to my other colleague, Robert Percival, the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law here at the University of Maryland uh, Carey School of Law and Director of our Environmental Law Program. Bob has an outstanding track record, particularly in all kinds of public policy. He clerked for the Supreme Court Justice Byron White, served as special assistant to the first US Secretary of Education, and was a senior attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund, all before coming to join us for the, in this faculty and launching uh, one of the premier environmental law programs. So I'll turn the podium over to Bob and say enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Bob. Thanks so much, Dean Haddon. Uh, this is really going to be a terrific symposium, and I'm um, honored to be invited to moderate this first panel. It's appropriate that the symposium start with the sports panel for a couple of reasons. Of course, today is Orioles opening day. And we used to have a tradition at the law school that on opening day, we would have a special lecture called the Huey Jennings Lecture. Why is it named the Huey Jennings Lecture? Because a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer from the 19th century, Huey E.R. Jennings, who had been a, uh, uh, 
a shortstop and then later became uh, the manager of the New York Giants, actually briefly went to law school here back in the 19th century. He didn't actually graduate from the law school, but he went on to a great career in Major League Baseball. And we had the first Huey Jennings lecture. We had Bill Gould, the chairman of the NLRB at the time, who had just ended the baseball strike. And we later had Ron Shapiro and Larry Gibson when he was counsel of the Umpire Association. So I'm proposing that we call this panel the, the annual Huey Jennings lecture so that we'll revive that important baseball tradition. The other reason why uh, this panel is so important is you can't avoid just picking up a newspaper and seeing social media issues involving athletes on the front page. This morning's New York Times has the case of some high school athletes who are arrested for statutory rape and how their colleagues are using social media to try to get them freed from prison uh, and the issues that's raised for a high school principal. Uh, you also have the case of the Rutgers basketball coach who, because of videotapes, uh, has now uh, lost his job and, and been disciplined, and that's really having great repercussions throughout academia. And a lot of people and a lot of lawsuits are being brought uh, in order to challenge what had been accepted practices of the NCAA. So we have a really terrific panel to address some of these issues. And I'll introduce our first speaker, who's uh, Frank Lomont, who's the executive director of the Student Press Law Center, which is a nonprofit legal organization, aid organization that serves the needs of student journalists nationwide. He's had a very distinguished legal career. He served as a law clerk to Judge Christopher Hagee in the Northern District of Georgia, Judge Lanier Anderson III on the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Before he went to law school, he was an award-winning investigative journalist and political columnist uh, with the Georgia-based Morris newspaper chain. And uh, he's going to be uh, discussing some of the issues and laws that affect uh, student athletes' use of social media. Thank you. I was a terrible shortstop. I will try not to dishonor <laughs> Huey's memory too badly uh, in this process. Um, since we have an audience of law students here, I must tell you, do not ever violate the first rule of litigation by turning your back on the bench. I, I, <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable with this perspective. Uh, I can't tell whether I'm prosecution or defense, but uh, I'll figure it out as we go along. Um, so I was asked to lay a little groundwork legally and factually for why this subject is uh, of import and, and, and why we convene this panel to talk about it. Um, and this is an auspicious time to do it. Uh, uh, some of you uh, may have uh, read that uh, Twitter, the uh, online microblogging service, just celebrated its seventh birthday the other day. I, I was founded in uh, March of 2006, and it just passed its 500th millionth user worldwide. Um, uh, Facebook, which is uh, just a little bit older, passed uh, 1 billion users recently. 42% uh, of all Americans are said to have a Facebook account, men, women, and children. Um, are said to have a Facebook account. Um, so social media really is is ubiquitous. It's universal. It's it's part of the oxygen that surrounds us now, and uh, it's inescapable that this is going to cause conflict uh, in the employment setting, in the academic setting, and uh, the courts and our policymakers and the legislatures, uh, uh, as they're often doing with technological developments, are racing to keep pace with this. Um, we have seen over the last couple of years um, a large number of uh, bills being dropped in state legislatures around the country, including here in Maryland, to regulate what an employer or an educational institution can demand of a student or of a job applicant or of an employee uh, in terms of access to their social media. Um, um, there's been sort of a backlash against the idea that an employer or an educational institution can demand to peek at your uh, uh, non-public parts of your social media account, the parts that you have uh, password protected or secured, um, as a condition of letting you attend the institution, letting you play on a team, uh, letting you apply for job or retain your job. Uh, so uh, five uh, states, including Maryland, have passed legislation um, that prohibit employers from demanding either a current employee or a prospective employee uh, from giving login information so that one can see uh, the uh, non-public parts of a social media account. Five states also have prohibitions against colleges or universities uh, making that same demand. And one, uh, Michigan, even uh, has extended the prohibition 
all the way down to the K through 12 school level. Um, this year, in two, uh, 2013, uh, two other states, uh, New Jersey and uh, New Mexico, uh, uh, passed uh, those bills and they're sitting on their respective governor's desks. Uh, uh, so, so there'll soon be two more states that uh, prohibit employers from uh, uh, demanding that information. And there are 33 uh, states with legislation uh, introduced or pending this year. So you can see that this is uh, something that states, uh, uh, that's catching on in a very big way, uh, kind of taps into a sense of uh, uh, personal privacy that somehow, even though uh, I am broadcasting information to an audience of my friends, um, that I don't mean for that information to be shared with people I'm not friends with, and I don't, uh, I don't wish uh, my uh, educational institution or my employer to be nosing into it. Um, well, so how does this um, come into conflict with, with the law? Um, um, just to, to start you off with one story, uh, uh, how, how this sort of became nationally prominent. Uh, back in 2010, um, a lineman on the University of North Carolina Tar Heels football team, a guy named uh, Marvin uh, Austin, uh, who was an NFL prospect at the time, uh, 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 sent out a stream of tweets uh, while playing at an away game at the University of Miami, uh, sent out some photos of a very large dinner check, um, a, a very fancy bag of designer sunglasses that he had apparently purchased, uh, and some tweets about the uh, very expensive steak dinner that he was enjoying. Um, um, this uh, uh, aroused the suspicion of compliance people who uh, later found out that he and other players at the uh, University of North Carolina had had uh, illicit dealings with sports agents, and uh, 13 of them wound up being uh, uh, sanctioned, and this led to the uh, demise of uh, Coach Butch, Butch Davis, who was forced to resign from the program and is still ongoing investigation at UNC. Um, well, this is sort of the uh, thread that unraveled the blanket. Uh, and after uh, UNC uh, and, and that uh, Marvin Austin uh, uh, situation came to prominence, colleges around the country started to enact various types of restrictions on their athletes' use of social media. Um, commonplace ones are uh, to require that an athlete has to give over login and password information so that the athletic department can monitor everything that goes on on social media or conversely um, that the athlete is banned entirely from using social media either during the season or entirely uh, during their playing career uh, at the institution. Um, this becomes a First Amendment issue if we're dealing with a public institution, right? Everybody knows that private institutions aren't governed by the First Amendment, and so if we're uh, dealing with a state uh, university, a state college, uh, there's at least some degree of First Amendment uh, uh, protection that, that arises, and the question is going to be, what is the legal standard uh, uh, under which uh, a restriction on an athlete's use of social media is governed? Um, the foundational case, the one that everybody should be familiar with, is the Tinker case, right? The Tinker versus Des Moines case uh, uh, struck a balance in which the government can regulate the content of a student's speech only if it is shown that the student's speech will substantially disrupt the operations of the institution. It's a rather highly protective standard. Um, although this, this uh, Tinker uh, case uh, arose in the case of uh, K-12 students, um, it's sort of presumed that it also applies uh, to college students, at the very least, that college students will have at least the, 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 the level of protection that is vouchsafed by the Supreme Court in the Tinker case, and possibly more. Um, so um, um, we know that if it is viewed as a content-based restriction on speech, that the Tinker level of scrutiny is going to apply. However, there are other schools of thought that may be uh, a ban on the use of a medium entirely, um, as many schools do, is not a content-based restriction at all, and ought to be viewed under something more like strict scrutiny, uh, uh, more like an unconstitutional conditions case in which the government is making you forfeit a benefit in exchange for receiving, in this case, a college education. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, wrap up there. I know time is limited and I want to hand it off, but um, I wanted to flag that issue of what legal standard ought to apply, and also, I guess, by way of wrap-up, say, I think there are some really interesting educational policy issues here leaving aside the constitutional issues that I hope we have time to get into, the main one being, and one that I deal with all the time in my line of work, the idea that in order to teach you how to use the internet properly, we must be allowed to punish you. The idea that we punish to teach, I think, is really an in interesting educational policy issue and one that hasn't been adequately examined and explored by our policymakers. Well, as um, um, Frank said, Twitter's now seven years old. About eight or nine years ago, I was at a technology conference every year. I go out to the Apple Macworld conference, and I actually met the founders of Twitter where they were showing a beta version of their technology. And I said to them, 
what possible purpose could this have? Who's going to use it? You'd have to be awfully narcissistic to think that people wanted to follow you, and boy, was I wrong. Um, our next speaker is uh, someone who has to deal with these issues in a very practical way because he's the Associate Director of Media Relations for the University of Maryland Athletic Department, Matt Taylor. We're all huge Terps fans, and I know his job must be very difficult when they're not winning, but fortunately this year the basketball team beat Duke twice, the football team doubled the number of its victories, so it should make it somewhat easier. Uh, he has a communications degree from Virginia Tech and an MBA from George Washington University. He uh, previously served as Assistant Director of Communications for the Indianapolis Colts, and previous to that he was with the Washington Redskins as a media relations assistant. So he deals with athletes face-to-face uh, -face on a daily basis. So I'll turn it over to Matt. All right, first of all, I guess I should apologize to all you. Um, I have a great history of losing. Uh, every year I was with the Redskins, uh, we were awful. And uh, my one season with the Colts, we went uh, two and 14. Had the number one pick in the draft, and that was after the team had made the playoffs nine straight years. So I apologize for bringing my bad luck to the University of Maryland to your school. I do apologize. Um, I think, uh, you know, I want to start off and say, you know, my background was in pro sports, which is a completely different game um, in terms of dealing with student athletes versus pro. Um, Twitter, I apologize also in advance because you'll see me, I'm going to look at this thing constantly because I'm on Twitter 24-7 looking at both uh, what the media is reporting and what our student athletes and, um, you know, coaches and stuff like that are saying Twitter, saying on Twitter because it has completely taken over uh, my life and my line of work. Um, one thing that I'm very lucky um, about right now is at the University of Maryland, I work pretty much just with the football team. And our head coach, Randy Etzel, is, could not be more forward thinking when it comes to social media. Um, you know, when I, when I came in this past year, one of the things that's key in the NFL and it's mandated is training to the athletes for the media. Um, for you, probably most people know this, but um, you know, one of the, probably the greatest commissioner in the history of professional sports, Pete Rozelle, who built the NFL to what it is now, he started in public relations. So a lot of the principles that has made the NFL very great was PR backed. So when you're in the league, they put a great importance in media. So with that, you know, when I came into the University of Maryland, Coach and I got together and we kind of talked about what they had been doing in the past and we decided, and he completely agreed and gave me the time, which most football coaches won't do, the best way to handle media, social media in general is training. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not there to run these guys' accounts. I'm actually not even allowed to have their password. That is, you know, I've, I know that for a fact. Um, I'm there to teach them how they can help themselves with social media and how they can hurt themselves with social media. Never do I tell them you can say this or you can't say that because that's not my job. Um, like I said, coach is very forward thinking. Um, our philosophy and what we tell the guys, um, you know, when I was in college, and I'm not that old, but you know, Facebook was kind of just amongst your friends. Well, nowadays you have to, when you use this, you have to go with the expectation that every member of the media is following you, whether it's on Facebook or social media. So anything you say is no different than, and now this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but if you say the right thing, it can spiral out just as big as this. It's no different than, you know, the president giving a news conference in front of a thousand people. I actually, I think this year when I did our training, I put a picture of President Obama up at the Democratic National Convention to show all the people and say, if you send a tweet, just know that it's the same as this, because if you say the right things on Twitter, it'll go just as far. And that's kind of our line of thinking. And we use it to tell the guys, you know, hey, I know everybody in this room has the goal and the aspiration to make it to the NFL. But you're also lucky to have the exposure right now that whether you make it to that or you make a name for yourself, that you can build your brand, that you have a successful career in business or whatever you choose to do when you use the University of Maryland, right now you're on the clock. So people are evaluating you. Um, and that's what's, that reputation is what's going to carry you for the rest of your career. So our thinking is use Twitter, use social media to help yourself, not to hurt yourself. Um, you know, I'll never tell a guy, don't take a stance on an issue. What I like to tell them is be prepared for the implications that might come. Now that's not, coach is gonna yell at you, you're gonna lose playing time, never the case. What it is is, now I'll give an example of professional athletes that have taken a stance on politics or any of that, 
and just show them if you do this, this is the this is what you're going to have to face in terms of now you became a speaker for this issue. So you're going to get a million interview requests about this, you know, and you have to answer them because this is something that you've taken a stance on. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Just make sure you're prepared to handle everything that goes with it. Every city we go into, you could very well have a writer that's going to ask you about this and everything else. Do you want to be the face of an issue? If you're prepared for that, that's fine. Most guys at 19 years old aren't really ready for that. Um, you know, I use a story, one of the guys I had with the Colts, and I'm not going to get into too many details because I don't want to rat him out or anything like that. Very, very bright guy, um, was very big in social media. And I mean, he was sharp, well read. Well, anyways, he worked a deal with a major network that he was going to be a correspondent for them and run their social media account for a week during the Super Bowl. Huge deal because he knows that when he's done playing football, this is the type of stuff that he wants to get into. About a week, no, it was about a month before, contract hadn't been signed yet. He decided to, um, he took a stance on a very hot topic in politics. Not bad at all. He's a well-read guy, you know, has no problem answering those questions. And the network said, you know, unfortunately, we're a news organization. We can't have someone that's working for us as a reporter that takes that stance. And he lost that deal, which would have been, a, you know, a great career builder for him. And I think he kind of learned, you know, he was still happy with the choice that he made, but I think it burned him a little bit. He learned his lesson about, you know, if you're going to align yourself with the news organization, these are the implications. So I just try to teach those guys. You know, the biggest thing, unfortunately, for student athletes nowadays, and it started at the high school level. Um, that's another thing that our coach has been very proactive is we have these recruits that they come in, and it's amazing. You have a high school kid who's 14 or 15 years old, He's followed by several thousand people, most of them media, and they're posting this stuff straight on the internet and everything else. Think of yourself at 14, 15 years old. Do you really want that type of pressure on yourself? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really scary. I tell them, you know, unfortunately with all the accolades and everything else you get and the attention and, and all that, it's, it's a responsibility. Um, so, you know, we talk to these student athletes and the high school kids, you know, I hate to say it, but you read a lot of the stuff, you know, they read and, you cringe a little bit because they just haven't had the training. We tried to get them, you know, we tried to get them when they come in, but it's, it's definitely an issue that, um, you know, I know some of our recruits coming in this year, they had um, a stigma already attached to them when they came to the University of Maryland for stuff that they had said on Twitter as a 17, 18 year old guy. And that's just something that, you know, doesn't mean they're a bad person, but it's, it's, it's really tough. Um, you know, kind of going, um, you know, from the athlete side of things, you know, like I said, that's pretty much, it's a huge thing. Um, you know, you say one thing on Twitter, um, I, I remember, and this is sad to say, I, I remember when Twitter was first coming new and we were kind of creating policies about it. Um, one of the first things that I had is a guy tweeting a picture of his teammate sleeping at a meeting and you have to call and, and you know, and get that, um, hey, coach isn't going to like this. Um, <laughs> and you have to explain to him and it's, it's tough because you try to teach them as much as you can, and sometimes it's frustrating because, you know, you, you, you think you've reached to them and everything else, but it's just constantly reaching back up on them. So, like I said, in my line of work, and I'm, and I'm very happy about this, our philosophy is to try to teach um, and, and kind of help them prepare themselves because we never want to tell people not to use the medium because it's something that's very powerful and something that they can build their brand and really do great things for themselves in their career leaving the University of Maryland and what they do. So like I said, our, our job and our mission is to prepare the guys. So. Our next speaker is uh, Phil Clotius, who's a former dean of the University of Baltimore Law School, now a professor of law there, and also former dean of the University of Toledo College of Law. He's a graduate of Notre Dame and uh, Columbia University Law School, and I must say, uh, I can testify that he's also an excellent athlete because uh, as dean, he used to go down to the UVA softball tournament. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor to the Maryland uh, softball team, and I won't remind him what happened the last time the two of us uh, played each other and he was pitching, but uh, um, uh, I will note that the UVA tournament is being held this weekend, and unfortunately, uh, Maryland's not going to be able to play, but it has nothing to do with anything that our athletes said on social media. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. 
Uh, none of you have had me uh, in class, so you don't know I'm really a pacer, and sitting down is tough for me. So if I start rocking, I apologize in advance, and, and I will tell you, I, you, you, you hit me hard if I remember right. I'm not really a pitcher, but I was in for that for that purpose. Um, I just want to talk about three different kinds of areas. One, just some general uh, First Amendment principles applicable here, and then two, kind of what would happen if you were doing this to the general student body, and then three, uh, you know, why do we think we can single out athletes for special treatment? So let's just take it in order. Uh, one of the thrills of teaching First Amendment law is, you know, we're constantly trying to deal with free speech principles into new technology. Uh, I teach uh, our First Amendment course, and, you know, new medias are propping up every, every year. And so you're constantly struggling with how do we adapt uh, First Amendment ideas to things that don't exist you know, two years ago, never mind in 1791. Uh, so some basic concepts, easy to get down if you've taken a First Amendment course, uh, you know. Uh, number one, uh, we really hate prior restraints. Uh, from the time of Blackstone, uh, we did not like uh, the, the government telling in any way before people spoke uh, that they couldn't do so. Uh, so, you know, what Matt was talking about is completely consistent with First Amendment principles. Uh, you can't be restrained in advance, and we assume you're an adult. Uh, if you say something really stupid, you may have to pay the price for that. And, you know, we live with that. Uh, back in, in, in early common law England, uh, you couldn't be restrained before you spoke, but if you spoke something that was treason to the king, they could still lop your head off, and everybody thought that was perfectly consistent with free speech. Uh, being punished for what you say is kind of part of the deal uh, if you say something that really um, is actionable. Uh, so I, I like the idea of training, uh, but again, the idea of stopping you from ever using a media is really antithetical to everything that the First Amendment stands for. Um, also, uh, you can't deny uh, access to an audience in general. Uh, when new media comes up, the one thing we know is a kind of First Amendment principle is a government attempt to say no one can use the Internet uh, is not going to happen uh, and be consistent with the First Amendment. And then last but not least, uh, as you know, uh, we really don't like uh, content-based distinctions, uh, particularly viewpoint-based distinctions. Uh, so if we're trying to shut somebody down because they're worried they're going to say something critical about the coach, uh, that's the highest level of First Amendment protection because it's not just on content, it's on a particular point of view. Uh, so again, those are kind of the general First Amendment thoughts you have uh, as, as themes that you're trying to apply to any new media. Okay, now social media in the academic context, let's think for a second about what you can do to the entire student body. I mean, does anybody think that it's consistent with the First Amendment for College Park to tell 25,000 students they can't use Facebook? A, if they did it, they wouldn't have 25,000 students <laughs> because admissions would go plunging, so you know they couldn't tell you in advance that that was the policy. If they were trying to apply it to the whole student body, I, I would think there'd be an, a national uproar uh, over you can't do that, and I don't think anybody would try. As you think about social media or any new technology, uh, the other thing is to analogize it to things we know. Uh, so for example, uh, could College Park get away with saying to their students, uh, before, you, before you mail a letter, we want you to bring it down to the provost office and we're going to read your letter and make sure that it's consistent with university values and positions. And if it is, we'll give it back to you. If it's not, we'll modify it and hand it to you until you can mail it home now. I mean, in the context of a letter, I, I think I'm pretty confident in saying there's not a chance that that would be upheld uh, in face of a First Amendment attack. Well, if that's true for a letter, isn't a text, isn't a tweet, fairly analogous to a letter. Again, if you're making it uh, publicly distributed, I guess I can understand that. But again, in a traditional pamphlet, writing, letter context, uh, these kinds of things would really not be allowed or accepted. All right, if you agree with me on that, then you face, I guess, the issue for today, which is, are athletes somehow different? 
If we couldn't do it for a 25,000 student body, can we somehow do it to this smaller group of athletes? And again, my perspective is no. Uh, there are certainly reasons why we should suspect the motives of an athletic department. Again, no offense to Matt, but let's just look quickly at, oh, I don't know, yesterday, and we have the Auburn scandal, and we have the Rutgers scandal. Uh, the most interesting thing about Rutgers, you notice no, no athlete protested. Um, this is years of abuse. No athlete ever protested. Um, the culture is to suppress things that are anti the program. Right? Most athletic departments are populated by control freaks who don't want any, no offense, don't want anything bad uh, coming out. Uh, as, as Matt said, uh, the phrase, coach isn't going to like that, is pretty well uh, rampant. So, you know, again, you have reasons why uh, you want to distrust the athletic department. Uh, can you say that athletes have waived their First Amendment rights? Oh, well, again, if you're in basic con law principles, you know, it's hard to waive First Amendment rights. Uh, you'd have to have it explicit, you'd have to have it knowing, you'd have to have it in advance, and you probably couldn't say, we're not going to give you your scholarship unless you sign this waiver. Uh, that would probably be a penalty or coercion. And again, you'd have to do it in advance. Uh, I wonder how Coach Edsel's recruiting would go if all of his prospective recruits were told they could never use social media if they came to Maryland. Uh, I suspect recruiting would go down because people just say, okay, if that's the condition, I'm just not going to come. And if they don't tell the recruits, then it's a hidden condition. You can't tell them once they're in, oh, by the way, we didn't tell you this because we knew you wouldn't come if you knew it. So now that you're here, uh, we're going to condition it. So uh, I think there are all kinds of problems in letting coaches uh, restrict social media just for athletes. Again, I think there are things going on out there and being proposed that would never be accepted if it was trying to be imposed on the entire student body. And there aren't a lot of great arguments for why athletes should somehow be treated differently, at least in my mind, uh, from the rest of the student body. Again, particularly if you've been around enough football coaches uh, and you, you understand that uh, uh, these are people that you, you might want to suspect their motives because it's mainly to protect the coaches and protect the program and have everybody on the same message. Again, uh, watch what's happening in Auburn. Uh, you know, we're a day into the Auburn scandal and everybody's already recanted. Oh, I didn't really say that. Um, okay, I guess those videotapes that the, uh, the uh, person has and those tapes were just wrong. But again, the pressures to not speak are already there. You don't need a ton of other rules uh, banning social media on top of that. Thanks. This morning when I checked my email, I had a, a piece of spam from the ABA advertising their new book, How to Use Smoking Gun Tweets as Evidence <laughs> in Litigation, um, which uh, shows how social media is becoming more important. Our next speaker is Brad Shear, who practices intellectual property, social media, sports entertainment, and corporate law for his own law firm in DC. He's an adjunct professor at GW, and he also uh, maintains a blog, Share on Social Media Law. So if you blog about it, uh, you really are an expert, right? I wouldn't call myself an expert, um, but um, I feel like no one can really truly call themselves an expert in um, most things, but um, I just want to say thank you to the University of Maryland. It's always an uh, honor to come back to my hometown, and it's um, definitely an honor to be on this panel with such, an with such esteemed colleagues. Um, I, I think I just want to ask everyone here, how many people have an iPhone or Android phone? Is there anyone that doesn't have a cell phone in this room? Okay, that's zero. So I, I just want to really hammer this home. Matt's job is very difficult, okay, and everyone else in his position in any, sp in any, whether it's a professional or a college program, their job is so difficult because since everyone has one of these, that means that everyone can say whatever they want, basically, at any time, and he has to be checking to see what's going on that, of the things that are happening in his program nonstop, and that is not a fun job. 
and it can be very difficult. Um, I work with both um, college programs and professional programs, um, professional um, sports organizations regarding the legal issues and compliance issues dealing in social media. And it's something I've been doing for a long time. And one thing that I've realized is that because the technology is changing so quickly and the people that are making the decisions are usually of a certain generation, it's made things rather um, cumbersome to try to make change happen and have people really understand what's going on. Um, when earlier today, um, when Frank um, mentioned about the different pieces of legislation out there, um, the legislation started in Maryland and it started um, because of some conversations that occurred with some state lawmakers. Um, I've worked with every single state um, that's passed or enacted the legislation, either the sponsors or someone there, and also with um, members of Congress on this legislation. And I look at it not from a constitutional angle. I really look at it more from a business and compliance angle because the, at the end of the day, you really want to make sure you protect the schools. Um, obviously, you want to protect the privacy of students, um, but when I have my clients, I focus on protecting the schools, i.e., with access comes responsibility. So if a school wants to have access to what their student athletes are doing or what their other students are doing, they may become responsible for everything that goes on. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Is everyone here familiar with the tragic case of Yardley Love? Um, okay, I see a lot of people nodding. Yardley Love, um, she went to the University of Virginia. Uh, she grew up in Baltimore. Um, she was murdered by George Hewley, also UVA student athlete, both lacrosse team members, and very tragic case. And there was a lawsuit uh, that came about about a year ago. Um, there was two lawsuits actually, one that um, was against um, George Hewley's family, George Hewley, and the other lawsuit was against UVA, the athletic director, and I believe some coaches. And fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know how you want to look at it, um, but it appears that social media may not have been, um, there was not a lot of social media evidence um, out there for the um, uh, plaintiffs to say, well, wait, wait a minute, you knew what was going on. Instead, there's other evidence out there. Um, and they're suing for $29.5 million. So can you imagine if the coaches knew um, about different tweets or about different digital evidence that was out there and didn't act upon it? Um, that would pretty much um, make the case very easy, in my opinion, for the plaintiffs. And you really just have to take a look at what happened in Penn State. Does anyone know what was the real determining factor for people to say, well, wait a minute, the administration knew or should have known what was going on? Can anyone say what was the one determining factor? Anyone want to volunteer that information? Emails. Emails from 12 years ago. Digital evidence. And because of several different emails out there, people were saying, well, wait a minute, it looks like the administrators knew or should have known there was a problem with someone who was on staff or recently retired but who had access to the facilities. And because of the digital evidence, we're talking an economic impact to the entire Penn State community of over $200 million. That's just the, because of a couple of emails. Um, and so I take a look at this more along the lines from a legal liability standpoint in a compliance standpoint, um, obviously the student privacy issues are very troubling. But what's unfortunate is that this is the problem. You have schools out there that there's a lot of fear, okay? My God, what are my students saying online? Is there any way we can help them out? And what Matt's doing is with educating student athletes, that's the way to go. You do not want to get into a situation where you become responsible for everything kids are saying online. It's insane. Um, there's several companies out there that are snake oil salesmen. They're going to schools. These guys that are running these companies, U Diligence, Varsity Monitor, Fieldhouse Media, if you start taking a look at the background of the people that founded these companies, you'll notice Deadspin is already out of these guys as having no connection whatsoever to college athletics before they started these companies. Okay? These guys are going out and trying to pitch services to, to schools that are legal liability time bombs. Okay? And there's potential, besides state privacy laws, you have FERPA issues, you have so many different data privacy issues, and you have tremendous legal liability potential right there. Because can you imagine if, for example, if a school has all these reports on all this digital information that a student, ha student is putting out? Well, what's going to happen 
some time when a lawsuit occurs, not because of that digital information, but because the student was involved in some type of altercation, a student committed a crime or something along those lines. And as what's been discussed over the last, um, last hour, there are issues that pop up all the time, not only in student athletes, but in other parts of the school. Do schools really want to become responsible for this information? And I really don't think they want to be responsible. And when, I work, when I've worked with state legislatures, I'm like, look, make sure you put in the legislation that the universities do not have a legal duty to actually look at this stuff. Because a school should not be in a position, well, wait a minute, a plaintiff comes back and says, you know what, this kid had a Twitter account. Where the hell were you? Why weren't you monitoring what this kid was saying or doing? Well, schools should not have a legal duty to monitor their personal, the personal digital accounts of their students, whether it's a student athlete or a non-student athlete. So I take a look at this, obviously from the privacy perspective, but more along the lines of how to protect my clients and how to protect um, schools from potential legal liability, because that's where I see things are going down. And unfortunately, if you have, there's a lot of fear out there. And the bottom line is, the only way to stop the fear is through education. And I really feel strongly that when you go into a school um, and once people are educated about these issues, then there's a societal change on how to deal with these issues. But absent people understanding these issues a little more, you say, well, wait a minute, the easiest way of dealing with this is, you know what, we're just going to put a Band-Aid on it and make these kids download an app that tracks all their information, which is not, for, I mean, you throw out the legal, uh, you throw out the First and Fourth Amendment issues and you focus on the legal liability issues, you're talking a major time bomb. So my feeling is once people learn more about these issues, therefore they will be able to handle them in a much better and much more productive and much um, uh, safer manner that protects them from legal liability. Well, we've left plenty of time for uh, discussions and back and forth. I wanted to, to start by just asking any of the panelists if there's anything they heard that they'd like to briefly reply to. I really do want to jump in, if I could, on what Professor Kloch said, because I think he flagged an issue that just can't be emphasized enough. It, this seems like pretty small beans that we're talking about athlete tweets, right? And, and, but, but I think it hints at something broader that's going on in the development of First Amendment law that really uh, deserves some, um, some close scrutiny. And that is this idea, because as, as, as you heard from the examples of uh, mailing a letter, right, uh, uh, we're, we're prepared, I think, culturally and, and, and uh, among some of our judiciary to forfeit some First Amendment protections in the online speech context that we would never countenance forfeiting in uh, the ink and paper world. And, and there's a sense that somehow um, the uh, reach and the ubiquity of online media has been such a game changer that it calls for tearing up the First Amendment playbook and uh, writing a new set of rules. You saw this um, um, rather frighteningly, and uh, there was a case two terms ago in the Supreme Court, the Brown versus Entertainment Merchants case. This is a case that struck down the California statute criminalizing the sale of violent video games to minors. And in the course of, of, that, uh, 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 of that ruling, Justice Breyer, who's normally a pretty good uh, pro-First Amendment vote, writes this concurring opinion saying, uh, write, writes a separate opinion saying, you know, I'm really not comfortable um, with the, these video games. Uh, this technology frightens me. It makes me uneasy. I'm really not so sure that we ought not have a separate set of rules because these video games are so uh, influential over young minds. And, and I think the idea that somehow the First Amendment is volumetric and that your uh, legal protection goes down with your ability to reach an audience is just to me a terrifying concept. I mean, if you apply that um, literally, right, then the Wall Street Journal, which sells two million copies a day, ought to have a thousand times less First Amendment protection than the podunk weekly shopper, right? Uh, I, I, or uh, if uh, uh, Phil's house is uh, fronts on uh, Highway 1 and 50,000 cars go by his house every day, I'm on a cul-de-sac where five cars go by my house every day, I know I have 10,000 times more First Amendment protection from my yard sign than his, right? And, and so we know that's not right. And I think we ought to resist that in the crafting of the rules of the road for the online world as well. You hit on a bigger issue in con law that's always in the forefront to me in, in First Amendment and technology, 
and that is how wise a system do we have when 80-year-olds are making rules to control 20-year-olds? <laughs> and they really don't understand the technology. Um, this is becoming an issue uh, in a lot of places. Uh, um, we've had judges in the Maryland system come to us and say, we don't understand the technology that we're ruling on, but particularly hard First Amendment. Uh, I suspect that if we went to the nine Supreme Court judges and say, uh, how many of you write letters as opposed to use Twitter, uh, they're all going to say, well, don't we all write letters? Of course we do. Uh, whereas if I ask you, uh, how many people have written a letter home as opposed to send an email? I mean, the thought of saying writing a letter home, you're all laughing. Uh, so, you know, we, we constantly kind of deal with that um, when you have an, an older group of humans uh, making rules with regards to technology that's, you know, 40 or 50 years uh, away from their normal lives. Well, so for, for that matter, there are many judges who intentionally wall themselves off from social media because they perceive it as a minefield of conflict for them. The idea that an attorney might send them a friend request in the middle of a trial <laughs> or that someone might look at their profile and conclude that they're friends with the assistant district attorney while presiding over a case, right? So many of them have actually uh, intentionally kept themselves from becoming familiar with the technology, um, which makes it all the more difficult to explain it to, uh, to them when, when, when the technology is issued a case. It's a great point because um, I've dealt a lot with legislators both on the state and federal level and as most people know most legislators are of a certain age and um, it comes down to trying to educate them on what's going on but interestingly more and more they're understanding it because they have children or grandchildren that use the technology and they want to make sure that their kids are protected and that they have the same types of opportunities that um, their children and grandchildren have the same type of opportunities that they had growing up, meaning that um, they would have personal privacy rights. And I think that's something that from the bigger picture, um, these types of privacy issues are not only just for whether or not you have access, but on some of the other bigger picture items, um, such as big data issues that will end up, I think, becoming um, a little bit more part of the conversation sometime in the near future. I thought uh, Brad made a particularly interesting point about how schools can be caught in between with the notion of, do you have a right to access people's social media accounts? And also the question of, do you have a duty to look at what they've agreed to disclose? In some cases, legislatures may intervene and try to draw those lines. And Maryland recently passed a social networking law that prohibits employers from requiring employees to disclose social networking account information. But of course, the NCAA now is in the middle of this battle of what is the status of student athletes? Do they have a right to control their image? Are they employees or just students? This morning's Washington Post has a column by Tracy Hamilton pointing out that when Kevin Ware got hurt and is now facing all these incredible uh, rehabilitation expenses, many schools would just say, we have no obligation to pay them. Louisville has agreed to pay them, but it's also now marketing this t-shirt in order to make money off the, the incident. So one question I'd like to put to the panelists before we open it up for questions from the audience is, now that we have a social networking law in Maryland, that applies to employees' social network accounts. Since athletes aren't considered employees, does that imply that a university could require its athletes to disclose that information to them? Uh, Everyone's well, looking at Matt. I'll still <laughs> <laughs> well, we when we to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's real fair. Let's go to the non-lawyer on the thing and ask him. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But you're great at fielding questions. So. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, I'll, and I'll say this kind of to touch on the points that have been, you know, made by everybody else and then let them get more into the actual law because, you know, other than my one semester of communication law and I think I did a business <laughs> law, you know, that's about all you go for me. But, you know, from a very practical standpoint, um, I think, you know, Bradley hit, hit it right on the nail head. You know, I, I joke about how I'm constantly on my phone checking Twitter and I might see 25% of what our guys say and I think I'm doing a good job. 
you know, when I was with the Redskins, you could look at your computer screen every single day and be there 24-7, and you legitimately could not keep up with your news feed fast enough to read everything that was out there, especially if, you know, I remember when um, we benched Donovan, or I shouldn't say we because I had nothing to do with it, but when Donovan McNabb was benched, and it just went crazy both from the fans to the social impact and everything else, you physically could not keep up with all of it. There is no practical way that um, any school could know every single thing that our athletes are saying. Um, it's just, it's, it's physically impossible. And I've never been in a meeting or talked to anyone where they've even said that that is remotely a good idea. It's always addressed, Brad and I were just talking, is, you know, they're adults. Um, they're free to say what they want. You know, know that when you're on social media, it's very much the same as doing an interview. But in terms of that, you have the same latitude as any student. Now, yours might go a little farther than the normal student that doesn't, that has 50 followers, but it's the same rules and implications. And I think, you know, from a practical standpoint, a PR standpoint, it's the way you have to do it. So. It's, uh, how many people have a Twitter account here? Okay, a, a significant number. I have a Twitter account, but in the past year and a half, I've cut back drastically on tweeting. Um, I have to be very careful. Um, I have a lot of reporters following me, and when I tweet something out, I get phone calls. Um, not every time, but I mean, if I write a blog post or um, say something, I'll get a call from either the New York Times, um, NBC News, Washington Post, and it's just a, the nature of the game for what I do, um, and it's because I go out and I meet, uh, meet a lot of people, and when I meet these people, exchange business cards, and they want to know, well, what's your Twitter handle? And it's just part of the whole game. Um, but so that's why I think students right now, everyone here needs to understand that whatever you put out there, some way, somehow, it's always going to be around. And there's never going to be a way to um, fully scrub something off the net. Um, there are companies out there that claim that they can do it, but you have to be careful with everything that you put out because there's also major legal liability issues such as defamation. Um, besides the IP issues, I know this is more of an IP um, focused um, day, but um, you also have to think about some of the other bigger picture things like, um, okay, well, if you put something out there, do you have the full rights? Um, and there's several different cases, which I'm sure later today they'll talk about more of the IP and whether or not you can tweet something out and just grab it off and utilize it. But get back to the initial question as far as whether the, um, whether the law may apply to student athletes um, and students. Um, one way it could apply is if a student has um, work study um, or maybe some other type of situation where they're either compensated. Um, I don't want to get into the uh, issue of, well, as a um, uh, scholarship compensation, that's a whole other issue, but um, if someone has work study or if someone has actually um, paid compensation from the school, that is an issue. Um, but I'd like to leave that to the law professors. Um, the law professor and um, the executive director of the Student Press Association, to, I guess, further that uh, conversation along. Well, I mean, the issue of whether athletes or employees is been litigated and settled, I think, at this point, that they're not. Um, but again, I, I come from a very pro-student, very pro-athlete perspective. I mean, the NCAA has been screwing athletes for 200 years, and they're not going to stop. So, um, you know, I don't think that that's really going to matter now as law. Um, I think it's settled, at least for, for the time being, that they're, that they're not employees. Uh, but again, the statute's application is good, but the First Amendment would still apply even if the statute didn't. So if a student athlete is not an employee, the statute wouldn't do anything, but you'd still have to have First Amendment considerations on whatever restrictions you're putting uh, on the student athlete, even if they're not employees. So. All right, um, let's open it up to questions from the audience now. Please bring around a microphone for you. Hi, my name is Chris Harris. Uh, I'm actually a professor over at Johns Hopkins Business School, and um, I'm also a practitioner in digital marketing and have been so for, uh, I don't know, close to 20 years. 
and um, well, I should say integrated marketing, now recently more digital. So this is like a, a, this is a fascinating topic, and it's really an important topic. Um, but my question about this is, where does the line of liability exist? And let me kind of describe maybe and, and visually paint a picture of how I see the social media and the integrated marketing uh, ecosystem. So you start off with the uh, technology platforms and the uh, innovators such as Facebook or Twitter. And then you have the actual agencies, both external and internal, uh, that uh, design, run, and, and uh, launch the campaigns. And then you have the end users or the users themselves. Uh, so they can be individuals, uh, you know, who are tweeting and, and uh, posting, uh, you know, their, their information or their thoughts. And frankly, this is a bit terrifying for anybody that is on the agency side, which I am in, as well as the, uh, within the brands. Um, because we don't know exactly where this line of liability exists. Um, you know, the users of the technology platform, uh, they are associated with, or they can be tweeting and, and uh, expressing themselves um, on their own free time, but on their own pages, they may have said, you know, I go to, to Johns Hopkins University, or I go to University of Maryland, or you know, I'm an alumni of this, and, or I work for this company. And so, in a sense, they are representing that company or institution. Uh, the same goes with the agencies who are designing and building these campaigns. Um, are they really liable and responsible for the information and being able to maintain uh, the information and, and be able to read every tweet and every post? Uh, it's almost impossible, and uh, but it opens up a big, you know, uh, problem of potential liability for those who are trying to manage all of this communication. The last thing I'll say is there are uh, coming on on uh, the market. There are these social media listening tools. Uh, they are so imperfect, and I represent a couple of clients, okay, who claim to have social media listening tools, but they're very imperfect. Uh, and even with that uh, technology and their capability of being able to identify specific keywords and specific trains of thought, because we don't speak in uh, proper grammar, if you will, and, and complete sentences through social media, it's impossible to even pick up on all the uh, trends and, uh, properly. So I know I kind of, uh, it was a big open-ended question, but the thing is, I don't know where and at what point uh, you as a, uh, the platform or the uh, de developer of the uh, technology, the, uh, the agency or those who are managing the campaigns or the user, where, where and at what point are you liable for your own uh, and, and responsible for your own actions rather than who you may be associated with? Does that make sense? Well, let me address that in a couple ways. First of all, um, this is something we deal with in the, um, in the ink and paper world a fair amount, and, and there's a pretty good body of precedent now from the ink and paper world um, that establishes that a, a student is not an agent of the institution that they attend. Um, and so uh, if a student is using the vehicle of the area that I litigate in student media, um, a newspaper or magazine, uh, uh, to express themselves, then the liability stops with the speaker and not with the institution. And that's true even if the institution has provided some level of financial support for the establishment of the medium. Um, it, it's based on a sort of an extension of the public forum concept, right? Uh, uh, nobody would think, let me just finish that thought. Uh, no, nobody would think, right, if, uh, uh, if, if, uh, uh, at City Hall, uh, I were to go up to the microphone during the public comment period at City Hall and spew libelous invective against the members of the city council, right, that the city of Baltimore was legally responsible for my invective, even though they paid for the podium, they paid for the microphone, right, because the, the liability would stop with me as the speaker, despite the fact that I was using a government-funded vehicle to convey my message, but go ahead. known that they're working 
for, it, it's known that they're working for that company because they listed it as part of their profile. And they'll start, uh, not necessarily speaking badly of the company, but they won't be representing the company according to the company standards. And that is very gray and kind of big brotherish um, kind of world that we're, we're living in right now. And that, that kind of, uh, that, that's part of sure. what my concern is. Well, and, and that's, I mean, that goes beyond the legal issue, but into a very interesting cultural issue that I think that all of this touches on, which is to say, and, 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 and I'm, I personally uh, think that a lot of this is going to wash itself out generationally. I think that uh, once we all have mutually assured destruction, because everybody has a Facebook page on which we've all said something intemperate, uh, that, that, that lots of us will develop a thicker skin and, and uh, won't, won't we want to be the one to cast the first stone. But until that time, until it washes out generationally, I do think we're going to see, uh, we see this fair amount of time in the educational context where uh, I, there was a very, very bad case of, from where I'm from in Atlanta, where a, uh, a teacher um, lost her job because she posted on Facebook a picture of her uh, toasting with some friends with a margarita. Um, and uh, uh, this was regarded by her employer as evidencing bad judgment, even though there was no evidence that she had shown the photo to students or that she had any students who were Facebook friends. It came to the attention of a parent uh, uh, through a third party, through a friend who was a friend of a parent, sees the margarita photo and says, oh, this is just setting a terrible example for children and, and what, what terrible judgment you've used. You're fired as a teacher for doing nothing more than having uh, an alcoholic beverage on her personal time that she was legally entitled to buy. Um, and, and so uh, one of the things that worries me about the degree of control that we see schools and colleges exercising is that I fear that it is culturally reinforcing that that behavior is okay in the workplace. You know, rather than, in other words, what we're saying is um, we are going to suspend you from college because when you get out into the workplace, your employer might fire you for doing this very same thing on social media. We are reinforcing to the person, and by the way, that's okay if your employer does that, right? Rather than uh, sending the opposite message, which is, you know, um, um, that would really be a jerk move for your employer to do that. And so rather than suspend you from school, we're going to have a conversation with you about good practices, uh, uh, but we're certainly not going to reinforce that it's a good management practice to fire people for having a cocktail on Facebook. I, I think that's a really uh, 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 unfortunate cycle that we're trapping ourselves in. It, I mean, there are different levels of liability, obviously, and some of them, we already know what the rules kind of are. For example, if you're an employee of Merrill Lynch and you send in an op-ed piece to the Baltimore Sun, you know, can they fire you for what you said in the op-ed piece? You know, that, that's a print exposure. Um, if you were drinking your margarita and the son decided to take a picture of you and you know run a story on people enjoying opening day before the game you've got the same issue if somebody says okay so so you've got the general liability which is very fact specific murky all that stuff what brad i think was trying to say before uh that a lot of universities don't understand is that when you ask for somebody's password or login information. Whatever your liability was before, you've just increased it. Because now you have access to the private messages being sent. And again, if we have <coughs> a shooting on campus or something horrible where we're now in litigation and now we're looking for anybody to sue, they're going to go back and say, well, you saw it. <coughs> Excuse me, you saw the crazy email. Why didn't you stop? <coughs> I do this in class now, sorry. <coughs> I'm not really dying. <coughs> so you, you, have to, you okay, Phil? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, from a liability standpoint, I, I tell my agency clients to make sure that they have proper <coughs> policies in place and to make sure that everyone's on board and they understand the policies because the last thing you want is possibly the FTC coming down and saying, well, wait a minute, um, there's maybe a advertising issue out here or maybe you have a blogger out here who um, is not actually discussing his relationship with the company that they're reviewing something um, about. So it's something where if you're hiring someone to uh, discuss your brand or talk about um, your company um, online, you have to realize that there's potential issues regarding liability, 
whether it's um, whether it's FTC issues for advertising, or whether it's um, defamation issues, or whether it's IP issues, or whatever it is, when someone is doing something on your behalf, um, you have to be very careful and make sure that everyone understands what um, what the liability issues are that are, and you have to understand that the buck stops here. Whoever hired that person may become liable if it's something that is within the scope of their um, employment. Obviously, if it's something that is um, way far out there and it's something that you never imagined, there, there's some other issues out there. But bottom line is always make sure that the people who tweet on your behalf or discuss your brand on your behalf are not only just brand ambassadors, but they understand the legal liability issues that coincide with that position. Yes. I apologize for my voice, I'm a little sick. Um, you mentioned the, the similarities between letters and the internet, or, or I see the difference between having a, a sign, a road sign on a cul-de-sac and having it on a busy road, but I feel like if you think about um, when you write a letter, you have, to, you have to think about what you're gonna write, you have to type it up, you have to put the paper in the printer, you have to print it out, it takes a lot of time to do that. If you're putting a, a road sign, a sign on the road, you have to go buy the paint, buy the poster board and put it up. So I feel like part of the, the, the real issue with the internet and with, with Twitter especially is that you can, you can put stuff up so quickly and you just, when you have student athletes, you know they're competitive, they're in the mood and they just, they just type something up real quick and set it out and then they lose control of it. Even if they themselves want to take it down later after thinking about it, they don't have control of it anymore. It's, it's all over the net. So I, I think I, I see and I see the benefit of educating and I think that's a big part but you know, what was it, Thumper, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. We've been learning that forever, and yet it's still, is education really going to help this? I mean, how do you? It, I guess this one I might actually know something about, so. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's funny you say that, because I think it was two years ago, um, like I said, one of the big things with the NFL is education. They do a rookie, rookie symposium where they bring all the draft picks in. They teach them everything from financial management, all that type of stuff, all the, you know, stuff that they could face. And uh, Herm Edwards, the former coach of the Jets, he had a really good speech one year. And the refrain that he kept on using is thank before you hit send. And that was with Twitter, um, text messages, everything, because like you said, it's instant. Um, I tell our guys all the time, uh, using the excuse, well, one, deleting it, people screenshot it right away. So that's not going to work. It's just, it's not going to happen. And then using the excuse that my Twitter account got hacked is about as good as, you know, in grade school saying that your dog ate your homework because nobody's going to believe it and it's awful. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with, I don't think we can tell these guys not to be on it. It's just, it's their right to be on the social media. Um, and I, I just think you have to educate them. I, as much as you possibly can to show how instant it is. The, I'll give them an excuse. I, I've put up a text message from a reporter that I've gotten um, at 2 o'clock in the morning asking what our like, third string wide receiver said on Twitter. I'm like, you guys don't <laughs> believe me that someone's following this. They care, OK? This is the Washington Post. This is the same newspaper that you know, broke the story that led to the resignation of you know, our president of the United States, OK? We're not playing around. So, you're 100% right. Is the education, does it work all the time? It, it doesn't, but I keep on trying to find new ways to show them that this is a real deal. And, you know, sometimes you just need to put your phone away. To that point, um, they don't do this in college. Um, in the NFL, they actually have a cooling off period when you talk to the media after the game. Well, it's also NFL policy. Now, this is also to protect their media rights. You're not allowed to tweet from the locker room. I believe it's about two hours, two hours before the game, and maybe it's 90 minutes, and then up until after the game until you've handled all your you know, post-media obligations. And I think you know, that rule also works well, not to just protect the media that covers the team, it also works well to give guys just a second to cool off. You, know, you try to say, you know, if you're emotional about something, the worst thing you can do is get on your cell phone. So you know, is, isn't the NFL now proposing to televise part of halftime in the locker room? Yeah, and, and, and that's another... Uh, what a minefield. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they do it now, but the, the way it works is you kind of get the... You usually get the option to review it before it goes out. They're, they're striving very hard, because I believe it's going to be in stadium. They have to give... They have to do something to try to keep upping the fan experience so people will come to the game as opposed to watching on your 63-inch HDTV. And, so. I'll, I'll try and talk without dying again this time. Um, <laughs> The only thing I want to say, you know, as, as you listen to the comments, 
uh, the two words I wrote down are fear and control. Uh, people are talking about, you know, we have fear about this, or you said control. And, and I have to tell you, as a First Amendment guy, uh, the First Amendment doesn't care about either one of those words. The First Amendment embraces chaos. You know, that's the notion of the First Amendment, is that we don't want the government controlling it, we're okay with the chaos, and understand that when you say fear or control, those are anti-First Amendment sentiments. Uh, because it is. It's, it's a doctrine that is much more, let it go, and let's see what happens uh, in its heart. So be yeah, careful that, using those words. I, mean, I, 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 I will associate myself with those remarks. <laughs> One of the things, you know, when we hear um, the judiciary policymakers, lawmakers talk about why they feel it necessary to apply different rules to online speech, we always hear about the reach and the permanence of online speech, but I think, you know, the law recognizes in other contexts, defamation being the one that I'm thinking of, that um, all speech is not created equal and it does have to be evaluated in context. And so, you know, for example, right, uh, uh, a, uh, a defamatory remark in the New York Times and a defamatory remark in The Onion, right, will be viewed very differently because people use those media and, and understand those media in very different ways. So the very same line which would get me into court and, and liable for defamation if printed on the editorial page in The New York Times would be a gut buster on, on The Onion, right, the very same words. And, and, and that's all because the context is understood differently. And I think, again, this is something that will sink into the judiciary and the policy making branch over time, people don't go to Twitter expecting to do sort of serious academic research, you know, I, I, and they certainly don't go to college football players accounts for that purpose. They, they, they go to college football players accounts to see people having fun and cutting up and screwing around. And so in that context, right, even though Twitter may reach a larger number of people than the professor's uh, 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 letter home to mom, um, it's also understood differently. I, I mean, I think that that's the other side to your coin, right, is that because we understand that this is uh, an immediate medium in which people do sort of pop off spontaneously, the law also ought to take that into account. started retweeting the tweets of just like local people. What was the one picture of the Statue of Liberty with the big storm coming in? And so, so then it, I think the context somewhat can get removed. And if you have these serious newscasts, that's like, you know, CNN or whatever publishing the Onion Post, and then people take it for what it, for it being real. Sure. Well, what would be the um, what would be the response of the judiciary or the law to the problem that you're identifying? How how could we deal with that through uh, uh, a judicially crafted rule or legislation without also uh, infringing on CNN's ability to retweet the uh, uh, information warning people to stay away from the school where the shooter is running loose. I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think, I, think um, I, I don't know. I, it's going to have to be getting more of the policies, I guess, getting more of the, of the readers and the viewers to require CNN and other p news people to take better care of what they're reposting and to do more investigative work and background. So I think it's just the people and... Now, now you're talking about the marketplace. You're singing okay. my song. No, <laughs> no. No. Uh, bottom line is, I got a question. How many people here have had sex ed at least one time in their life from grammar school or college? Everyone in this room, right? Now, how many people here actually have listened to everything that you were taught in sex ed every single time? Followed it. <laughs> Zero. Okay. So, just think about this. So, Obviously, education on what to say, what to do, and how to um, act online is very important, but it's just human nature. You're going to learn or you're going to be told certain things, and you're not always going to listen. Okay? And it's just, it is what it is. So that's why you have to think about this. Well, the best way to handle it, just like anything else, is you educate policies, constantly educate, and you hope the people who um, you're trying to educate eventually get it, and usually they won't until they get burned, and that's just the nature of the beast. And so that's what we all have to look forward to. When you do something dumb or do something wrong, you learn from your mistakes, and it's the same way when you tweet something out or you post it on, on Facebook. I was just going to add in uh, 
nobody, I think nobody's innocent in this one. Uh, the story that comes to my mind, one of the, uh, the highest read columnists when I was in with, with the Colts in Indianapolis, someone created a fake, it was a fake account and tweeted something about our, one of our better players getting traded. He retweeted it and then started writing about how we had just <laughs> traded Dwight Freeney to the Patriots. And then he realized that it wasn't actually Adam Schefter from ESPN's account. It was like one letter was misspelled. <laughs> and you would not believe the upwork because everyone's thinking you have this well-sourced columnist, blah, blah, blah. And I think that was the perfect picture of this is the landscape we're in nowadays. And you have, to your point, you have to be so careful about the sources that you're looking at before you start spreading information. But you know, to, to quote that great First Amendment theorist, George Steinbrenner, <laughs> uh, you know, write good, write bad, but please write. Yes. Uh, is the NFL really this upset that we're all constantly talking about the NFL? <laughs> they Even love if it. it's, of they course. Love it. So from the big picture again, the First Amendment embraces the chaos because the truth is, is most of the people are perfectly happy that you're constantly talking about them, even if it's to say this was a mistake. Oh God, you know, you yep. think the Colts were upset that you had that all that these day? People? That day was a little, but you're right for the most part. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, I mean, from the big picture, and it's that's all why making money for the NFL. And that's why there's so many. The NFL is very forward thinking this, and they have rules that protect your Twitter rights. You know, the, you have these. I don't want to say it badly because I like all these guys, but you have these coaches that are always paranoid about everything getting out and stuff like that from a scheme standpoint. So they're like, no Twitter during practice. You know, we have to be very limited. <laughs> well, the NFL comes in and they realize that what do the fans crave? They want updates all the time from the writers about what's going on. So they put rules in place of which you have to allow the media to do. And it's very smart because it's a big business and that's what the fans want. And of course the relentless profit machine of the NFL wants no Twitter in the locker room because they want to sell the locker rooms on some DVD somewhere and make another dime off it or put it on at the stadium to enhance the experience. So, I mean, don't kid yourself. I mean, some of these restraints are because the teams want control over the event or the locker room or the halftime speech because they're going to exploit it financially. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more complicated. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Back there. Um, I have a general question actually about um, K through 12 schools ability to discipline and regulate students for online speech and Mr. Lamont, you mentioned the Tinker case. Um, the Supreme Court recently denied four petitions for certiorari on cases on the issue of whether Tinker even applied uh, to online speech. And the question is really, is the speech off campus and therefore outside of uh, the school district's ability to regulate um, because it, it originates on a home computer or a laptop? or is it on campus because of its effect and therefore within the school district's ability to regulate? And there's currently a case percolating in the Fifth Circuit um, and there may be a decision within the next few months that could lead to an additional uh, petition for certiorari. Is this the Taylor Bell YouTube case? Right. Yeah, we're um, in that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering if um, you could, uh, the uh, panelists could comment on whether uh, they think Tinker is needs to be tinkered with uh, in order to, be, to deal with sort of these 21st century realities um, or if a new standard is necessary. And then also whether the issue of cyberbullying um, might mean that um, sort of the lesser examined prong of the tinker test, the um, rights of others prong, might be given new life or, or any life at all um, as far as regulating um, speech online that could be uh, construed as cyberbullying or online harassment, student on student. Sure. Thank let me, you. Let me start with, um, that's a great question. Thank you. I mean, this is probably the single most active area of First Amendment litigation in the federal courts today. There are cases everywhere on this, and they're almost all in the K through 12 setting. Um, um, but uh, as we've seen, um, the law of K through 12 schools very often winds up percolating up and being applied to the college setting as well. So all, all of us at the college level need to be vigilant about this as well. Um, I'll tell you why 
we're convinced that Tinker strikes the wrong balance when you're talking about off-campus speech. Um, as a legal matter, right, well, Tinker was crafted, this idea of the substantial disruption standard is a compromise between no First Amendment rights at all and full-fledged First Amendment rights that any citizen would have, right? Because as a citizen, I have the right to say all kinds of substantially disruptive things about government agencies, right? I, I can only be stopped if literally what has the Supreme Court told us, maybe I'm about to publish uh, United States invasion plans uh, that will put our troops in harm. So maybe, maybe I can be stopped. Um, but uh, um, the Supreme Court you know, certainly wasn't contemplating that the authority of the school would follow you home and take care. The, the whole concept was students don't leave their First Amendment rights behind at the schoolhouse gate, which implies that they were carrying them at the time, right? Um, and so if, if, uh, if, if Tinker were to apply to off-campus speech with the exact same force as on-campus speech, um, um, here's what would happen. Right now, if a student wants to engage in whistleblowing speech on campus, student wants to say something bringing to light wrongdoing that is going to cause the school to be deluged with phone calls, going to cause parents to pull their children out of school, right? Uh, say you have a coach who's uh, abusive to uh, uh, children, you have a, a, a teacher who's abusive to children. Um, the school can probably tell you, do not march up and down the hallways carrying this sign saying the coach is an abuser because you will substantially disrupt the operations of school. But if Tinker applies with equal force, they could also say, and also don't take that sign into the school board meeting. Also don't march up and down in front of the school board building with that sign because that will also substantially disrupt school. So there's got to be some greater degree of protection for off-campus speech for the whistleblower, for the kid who wants to do something that will cause a ripple effect at school, but maybe a ripple effect that needs to happen at school. So there needs to be a greater degree. I would, I would personally, and some of my First Amendment friends are appalled that I'm willing to go this far, I would personally be willing to go with something like a wrongful intent to disrupt school. That would get to the kid who emails in the bomb threat. You know, I, I, I've got no problem with that. But it's got to be something more than just pure tinker. It can't be the case, because don't forget, tinker was coined in the setting of a captive listener audience. That is, if I wear the t-shirt with the Confederate flag on it, I'm thrusting that in your face and by golly you're going to have to look at it all day long. But on my Facebook page, you need not look at that. And if you're offended by it, you can shut it down and avert your eyes. So the balance just, just, just falls quite differently, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what everybody else thinks about that. Start with what we know. Uh, K through 12 matters to me because there are First Amendment rights in minors, but they're less. Uh, so I don't, you have to start off with that premise. So if you jump to college, you've jumped into the adult world, uh, the First Amendment rights are more significant. I mean, I won't get into, you know, compelling versus important and intermediate and stuff like that. But, but First Amendment rules are pretty clear that, that 18 and under, you have First Amendment rights, but they're less than full adults. Uh, having said that, I don't see Tinker as, as, I understand it's applicable, but not terribly. Uh, Tinker to me was about, uh, can you disrupt the math class? You know, that's really what Tinker was dealing with because we're wearing the armbands in school, in the classroom, and it's about, you know, are we disrupting the teaching of English or math or French or whatever we were doing? Uh, so, so when you're talking about uh, doing things outside the classroom, uh, I don't see Tinker as being uh, at least directly on point, at least the hearts of Tinker. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going brain dead on names, but the, uh, the case where the, the kid is holding up the bong hits for Jesus sign. <laughs> Morse versus Yeah, Friday. Morse. Uh, thank you. Uh, Maybe more on point, uh, because there you're dealing with, it's not in the classroom setting. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still said to be uh, within the student uh, uh, school environment because it was a school sanctioned event but it's outside but um, uh, yeah I, I, I think there should be uh, a standard uh, uh, that differs I don't think the argument of uh, gosh you criticize the coach at midnight that substantially has disrupted the school uh, is really is really a valid one I don't think that that's the kind of disruption that Tinker was talking about uh, Tinker was talking about we can't teach math not you made us look bad. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I again, uh, you know, there's reason to distrust uh, authorities who have, uh, you know, a very broad view of what uh, substantial disturbance is. 
and you know, I, I don't know how far you want to let that go, uh, you know, with the school's ability to regulate out of school activity, but I don't think Tinker, uh, you know, is, is really directly on point for it, and I would, I would distinguish it. Well, I've just gotten the signal that our time is up for this panel, so let's thank all these wonderful panelists.